start with a load of conceptual stuff. And then, uh, but then we're going to go very practical, three very different examples. So it's certainly a talk of two parts and quite radically different. I'm going to talk about the conceptual framework for the protocol, which is nice and, and simple, thankfully. A bit about value perspectives and how we think about those in the protocol, because this has caused a fair bit of confusion and maybe a little bit of angst. Um, and impact and dependency pathways, which for me are the foundation of natural capital assessments. And they're one of the things that's somewhat different about a natural capital approach to a, a conventional environmental management approach that we've seen from lots of companies for a long time. Um, and then some examples. So a simple conceptual framework, hopefully with the light, you guys can see this all right. I can't see it from here at all. Um, so business has impacts and dependencies on natural capital. So far, so illuminating. Um, I would say that actually, though, there's something interesting in, in saying this because it highlights the interdependencies between companies and the environment, which is kind of key. It's not something that's out there. It's something that is uh, inextricably linked with, with business. That creates, those impacts and dependencies create costs and benefits. They create costs and benefits directly for businesses, create costs and benefits for society. And obviously, business is part of society, and society also depends on and impacts on natural capital. So you have this either virtuous or non-virtuous cycle. And those costs and benefits, the existence of those costs and benefits means you have risks and opportunities for businesses. And risks and opportunities are what businesses are all about, frankly. They're about avoiding risks, and they're about exploiting opportunities. And if you can do that as a business, then you're getting things right. So what that implies is that, to me at least, measuring and valuing impacts and dependencies can give companies new insight into risks and opportunities. Now we hear a lot about the risk side, and, and a lot of the companies that I work with, the, their way into this is about risk. It is about their big supply chains. But actually I'd say for the, for the owners and the managers of natural capital, for agribusinesses, uh, for, for foresters, for water companies, um, for even, even for other infrastructure providers, the natural capital space is a colossal opportunity to recognize the value of natural assets that they own and manage in ways that we just haven't done historically. So I see the opportunity side of this hugely weighted towards those folks who are closest to the natural capital. That's not always how it's perceived. So whose value perspective are we interested in when we're, we're looking at valuing natural capital impacts or, or dependencies. In the protocol, we make a pretty simple distinction, a simplifying distinction. And it's unashamedly corporate-centric. The protocol is for businesses and to engage businesses. So we talk about business value. And by that, we just mean, essentially, something that's going to hit the bottom line in some way. And that might be indirectly through reputation reputational benefit, it might be indirectly through regulation or consumer action, but it's business value, financial market value. Doesn't take account of externalities. And then we talk about societal value as the, the counterpoint to business value, but actually business value is part of societal value. Societal value though includes all the non-market benefits that we get from natural capital. It includes the externalities, the negative and positive impacts that businesses, that other, other actors have on natural capital. Now importantly, we make the recommendation in the protocol that if you're engaging with natural capital and natural capital assessment, a complete assessment has to look at both of these aspects. And to be honest, it's most additive when a natural capital assessment by a corporate also looks at impacts on society, impacts outside of the business. Now, what we, what we learn as we go on through these assessments is that these two concepts become over time intertwined and actually what is societal value over time is tending to become business value. Externalities, as economists would say, are tending to be internalized, they're tending to be imposed on businesses or even offered to businesses. A couple of caveats in a way at the bottom to say societal value could be lo uh, values affecting lots of stakeholders and, and it's not enough just to say the societal value is more from this solution than that solution, therefore let's go after this solution. Um, we also need to account for 
dis what we call distributional effects, how are different stakeholders affected. So it's not intended to simplify the whole debate into a, a, this, this two binary concepts of value, but rather to make a clear distinction for corporate managers about uh, sources of value. So, last foundational concept. Impact and dependency pathways. I say these are the foundation of natural capital assessments. They certainly underpin natural capital methodologies. So an impact pathway describes how something a business does, some kind of activity, results in what we call in the protocol an impact driver, something that you can measure at the corporate level like greenhouse gas emissions or like air emissions or like use of land how that causes changes in natural capital, changes in the physical environment, essentially, and how those changes in natural capital affect different stakeholders. So they basically tell us what we need to measure at the company level, what changes in natural capital we need to be thinking about, and how those changes affect st stakeholders, therefore what we need to be valuing if we're valuing impacts. And dependency pathways, a similar kind of story, basically illustrating how companies are dependent on natural capital and how changes in natural capital are going to affect the costs of, of doing business. So I've just pulled these, in, in the true spirit of the Creative Commons license of the protocol, I ripped these diagrams straight out of the protocol and split them into bits. So I say business activities generate emissions or resource use, what we call impact drivers. So that's the bit we can normally measure at a company level, and lots of companies are measuring that. But then it's, it's necessary to consider how does that create changes in natural capital. In the case of air emissions, how do concentrations change? Do wind conditions mean that actually the air emissions are dispersed and they're not an issue? If I'm using water, who else is using water? How scarce is water? What's the context? And that's a, a piece that goes beyond most corporate environmental reporting. And then how do those changes in natural capital affect people? What's the, what, what are the endpoints that we might value? So in, this, in the case of air pollution in the example, the endpoints that we're valuing are actually principally impacts on human health. You know, air, air pollution can be deposited on crops and it can cause acid rain and it can cause other effects which can also be valued. The biggest chunk of that is, is really about how it affects people's health. And so that's the, the, generally speaking, when we value the societal impacts of air pollution, we're valuing impacts on people's health. Real simple example, oh, to illustrate this idea of dependency pathways as well. We've heard quite a lot about pollination, and pollination is the, this sort of wonderful example that people can kind of get their heads around. I, I, I think it's neat, and we used it in the protocol as well. So a coffee factory dependent on coffee plants, obviously, which are dependent on natural pollinators. Some kind of change in natural capital means that a whole bunch of those pollinating insects are lost. So that's a, a change in natural capital affecting a dependency that, that that enterprise had. And then how might we think about the value of that dependency? Well, we might think about it in terms of how can we replace the, the pollination service that, that was there? What would it cost us to replace it? Um, and that's a you know, particularly narrow example of valuing the benefits of pollination services. Um, if you get a chance to hear Jane's talk that she gave last Friday at some point, she's got some fantastic, much, much broader and more interesting examples of how pollination is valuable in lots of different contexts. So that's the conceptual bit. I'm going to go up about... No, I'm not going to go up too much, actually, because the first example is very site-level, very practical. But these are three different examples. So one is a site-level, so natural capital assessment being used at a site-level. One is a whole enterprise, whole value chain, thousands and thousands of suppliers, hundreds of countries. Looking at, that one's looking at societal impact. And then a national infrastructure example, big linear infrastructure, and looking at societal and business impact as part of a broader assessment of the impacts on all the capitals, impacts on uh, economic, social, and, 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 and even tax, fiscal impacts. So three really radically different examples of natural ca capital assessment being used, all of which build, all of which take, are, are based on the approaches and the, and the process set out now in the natural capital protocol. 
So the first one, one of the few, few cases where an economist like me gets to tramp around in some wetlands in Malaysia. This is southern peninsula Malaysia. Is this point to work? Yeah, I've got my finger in front of it. Okay, brilliant. This is southern peninsula Malaysia. This is, it would be Singapore right here. These are some important wetland sites, Ramsar sites they are. Um, now we were, we were asked to come in by a developer that's developing a big region around here. And they had become conscious that basically the degradation of the mangroves, which they don't own and, and don't control, was affecting their, threatening their business. And it was also threatening, they thought, the economy of the region, but they didn't have any numbers to put on that. So they asked us to come in and assess what is the value of these different sites to the regional economy and to them as a developer. Now, this is just one of the outputs of that piece of work. So the, the three colors you can see here, these are the, just the three different sites. The benefits that we assessed from the sites are along the bottom here. And what they were being managed for is uh, some freshwater fishing licenses and some commercial timber extraction. Now, what the vertical axis, don't worry too much about the specific figures, but the vertical axis basically says, what are these services worth? So effectively, the, the, the relevant regulators and, and local stakeholders were managing the sites for these two benefits down here. The sites were delivering this suite of benefits over here, which were more than 200 times the value. The degradation of the sites was degrading these services pretty rapidly. So examples like 30% of the, the, the Malaysian offshore fish catch apparently grows up in coastal mangroves. And these, these coastal mangroves are some of the most important in the region. So just apportioning that, that, that contribution to offshore fisheries gives you this huge number over here, completely unmanaged and invisible at the moment. Lots of other roles that were important, including particularly coastal protection, protection of agricultural land, as well as developed land. So pretty stark example of how just assessing the value of natural capital beyond the private market values that the, the folks managing the site could radically change the, the, the perception of what to manage it for. Totally different example. I kind of love this visual. It's from uh, Caring. Uh, they're the parent company of Puma, of Gucci, of Yves Saint Laurent. Some of you who've been to the odd conference might have heard Michael Beutler talk rather excitingly about their work, and I do think it's fantastic. And we have had a full disclosure, a hand in helping them over the last few years with this work. So what this diagram shows is not just a bunch of pretty colors. It is from here, their, their stores, their supply chain, uh, sorry, their, their, their own operations, back to here, their raw material production. And these are the major stages in their supply chain. So assembly, manufacturing, raw material processing. And this is the aggregated results across these six different areas of impact. So what these numbers actually show is the scale of the negative impact that that whole group of companies is having on natural capital and the value of those impacts on society. Now, this is one of those classic uh, reposts, I think, to natural capital assessment is about greenwashing or can be used for greenwashing. So this is, a, uh, for me, a great example of how you do natural capital assessment thoroughly and across your whole business and you establish on the balance of positive and negative impacts that actually you have what is a pretty huge negative impact overall throughout your supply chain. And then you can put that information into action to start managing that impact. Well, it's, it's not greenwash, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's kind of the opposite of, of greenwashing. And it's a, 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 a sort of an action in radical disclosure that's completely different to what we've seen historically, I think. So one example of how they're using this, it's all about materials and their supply chain. So these are a whole bunch of different materials that they use. The bars up here, you probably can't read the colors too well, but these are the negative impacts associated with those materials. And these are the quantities of materials that they're using down at the bottom. So some of them like animal fibers, like metals, they're using in pretty small quantities, but they're having pretty big impacts. Leather is this huge bar over here. Now they use that information then to, to look at how can they improve? Basically, how can they reduce the negative impacts that they're having, ideally without affecting their bottom line? 
Now, in this case, we've got them dissecting uh, a, a pair of fancy, probably Gucci shoes. And we've got the bits of that shoe production in here. So the leather upper, the laces, the soles, the manufacturing process. And each of these, I don't know if you can read them, each of these is basically, so here we've got alligator, calf, pig leather, who knew, uh, and different intensities based on the natural capital in impact. So what, what you can sort of see is lots of options between these and, and tons, tons more options in the analysis. Each based on a deep dive into these locations to look at well, what are the natural capital impacts associated with my sourcing from these places. And, and, and the upshot is basically you take the higher impact options and you have an impact of a negative impact of 42 euros. You take the lower impact options, you have a negative impact of less than 10% of that. Now in this case, they think the, the, the effect on, on the cost of a pair of shoes is, is pretty nominal of switching between these two options. So it's just new information that allows a better decision with, as far as I am concerned, no real downside. So. Last example, very quick one, completely different example again. The Bewley Denny uh, line in Scotland, a, a, a massive piece of linear infrastructure in Scotland, uh, putting new uh, electricity cables across the, 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 the sort of heart of Scotland. Essential national infrastructure, actually infrastructure bringing offshore wind power down into the rest of the UK. So kind of an upside that the, the, the assessment wasn't even concerned with, but they were going from smallish towers to humongous towers, they had a whole bunch of options about how that could be done, and it took an absolute age to get consent for that effort. And one of the conditions of the consent, or several hundred of the conditions of the consent, defined a bunch of changes to the line. And the, the, the company enacting this, um, Scottish and Southern Energy, wanted to look at, were those changes worth the extra cost. So you've got a financial cost to the, to the bill payer or to the taxpayer, and you've got a bunch of changes to um, infrastructure to safeguard natural capital, principally to safeguard visual amenity effects. What was, was that trade-off worth it? So this, this is why I said using natural capital as part of a wider assessment. Here we're looking at the, these are the Im impacts on natural capital, and you can see this huge bar here, the major area of concern, and as it turned out, the major area of impact was impacts on the, on the landscape of Scotland. So this line was passing very close to the Cairngorms National Park. It was affecting lots of uh, great scenery, and, and it was affecting a lot of tourism and recreational users in Scotland as well as local folks. Now what the, the whole assessment shows is there was some positive economic contribution of, of generating, the, of, of building the line, a bunch of negative impacts on cultural heritage and tourism and this huge impact on the landscape. The, the line that was actually built had quite a different profile of, of impact. And you see the major shift is on the, the landscape bar. So, this is based on moving it away from the sites that people most commonly use, taking it out of sight lines, actually at, at major expense, undergrounding part of the line. And what you get to in the end is the net impact of those changes. So the total value created for society of those mitigation measures, which were costing real hard cash, 77 million pounds for UK taxpayers, but the benefits overall if you add up all the bars around the outside, and the principal benefits were improving, massively improving the impact on the landscape in Scotland, was a pretty healthy return on investment. So actually, this, this quite messy planning process had, had ended up delivering value for money changes, if you want to put it like that. Now probably it could have delivered more value for money changes with some different design, but that's where I'll leave it, three different examples, thanks. Will's obviously taller than I am. Um, 